Hey folks, it's your main man Sabado. Um, for those of you that have been here before, uh, welcome back to the channel. And for those of you that are new, welcome. Uh, this is a channel where the underlying premise is I don't expect everybody to retire early, but I do expect you to live your best life. And so what I try to do to help each of us get to the point where we're living the life that we want to live is I just share some of the perspectives that I've learned and that I've picked up over the years. Some are going to be useful for most of us. Some may not be useful at all. And if there's perspective out there that you think is going to be even more useful for you, let me know. I don't get overly technical. I really just talk to you about my life, my journey, my path, and, and how I got here because a lot of us aren't where we want to be, not because we can't get there, but because we've never been given the information. So what I try to do is just share some of that information. So on that note, I want to talk to you today about some things in my life that have changed, or at least how my thinking has changed. Uh, many of you know that I've been retired for a year. Uh, it was just a, a year uh, last week, and I, I it's just this phenomenal transition. And I've, I've had the opportunity to look at myself in a snapshot of a year ago when I retired and, and who I was then, and go and look at myself now. And, and there's some very specific things that have changed for me that I think are important. And as I was trying to figure out how I'm gonna get at that, I was, I was listening to what they call my Yacht Rock uh, playlist, and there was a song that came on. Uh, it was Fleetwood Mac, and it's called Landslide. And it says, well, I've been afraid of changes because I've built my life around you. But time makes you bolder. Even children get older, and I'm getting older too. And it's funny, I think, when you think about how many of us have built our lives around work. And so the idea of doing something different is really overwhelming to a lot of us. And there's more to trying to retire or live in your best life than just leaving your job or doing something that you want to do. But it's tr the transition of your mindset to be able to handle that because change for a lot of us is incredibly difficult. I know for myself it was. And so today I want to talk about uh, four things that uh, specifically that changed for me in terms of my thinking since I've retired and really have helped me become a better me. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So number one is the way that I look at money is completely different. Uh, for a lot of my life, a lot of people could say a lot of things about me, and, and a lot of people do. But one thing people cannot say is that I was never good at being able to find ways to make money, to get jobs, to sell t-shirts when I was in college. I've, I've always done that well, but I was always focused on how do I get more, how do I get more, how do I get more. But now, now that I've reached this point where I'm retired and I have money that's kind of working for me in the marketplace or in the investment marketplace or through our rental properties, um, I don't focus as much now about making more money. As long as I can cover my expenses, I'm good. And that really creates a peace of mind. I, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and one of the things he was telling me was he got laid off. And so it really forced him to look at what it is that he's that he's doing and how much he spends and what his costs are. And his situation is different from mine because he has young children at home. But it's interesting the transition he had once he had a little bit of time to think about it. And he said to me, he says, you know, Sabado, I don't need as much money as I thought I did on a monthly basis because once I started trimming back, I realized how much of the money that I was spending in the first place was crap. And so now I could probably live on less than half of what I was making before, particularly if my wife is working. And so when you make that transition from thinking about making more money, just thinking about your experiences or your expenses, it becomes an incredibly liberating uh, process. It's, uh, you, you take the pressure off yourself because most of the pressure that we have, and I know at least for myself, and please tell me, if, if your experience is different, but most of the pressure that I've put on myself was pressure for myself. The fact that I felt like I had to be perfect. The fact that I had to be a high flyer. The fact that I had to do certain things. Nobody was telling me, hey, Sabado, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. And I, I think being a self-starter, I put that pressure on myself. And they say a vice is always an overextension of a virtue. And so Ask yourself, am I doing that or do I really need to make all this money that I'm making? And, and, and folks, I recognize that some people are in a circumstance where they can't do that. 
But I think the bigger piece of that is asking yourself, are you in that situation? And then once you figure out what your expenses are, automate those expenses. I've taken my expenses and everything that I have to pay on a monthly basis because I know what's coming in and I know what's going out, I have those automated. So I don't even think about it. And at the first of the month, all of these bills are paid and I know that whatever's left in my checking account is money that's there. So if I'm tight or I'm not, then it's on me. So, uh, so again, the way that I look at money has completely changed and it's really reduced the pressure because again, retirement, living your best life is really more so about peace of mind than anything else. And money is the one thing that keeps most people up at night. Uh, number two is the way that I look at my time is different. I was always, I always operated as though I was fortunate that other people were allowing me into their space to use my time with them. And as I started to go back and review the important events in my life and the important people in my life, I started to understand that as much as I might have thought that, the people I was close to, it wasn't even about what we were doing. It was about who I was doing it with. And so, and again, to to make that a little more concise, I started to think about it's not what you're doing, but who you're doing it with. And I started to look at time as a, as a resource because you can make more money, you can find new friends, you can buy a new car, you can get a bigger house, you can get anything you want, but what you can't get is you can't get more time. And sure, you, could, you can prolong your time or at least have the illusion of prolonging your time by taking care of yourself or giving yourself the peace of mind that you're going to live a longer life by doing the right things. And I would advise anybody to do that because I do think there is something to the science of medicine. But the reality is, is that we're all going to die at some point. And I I know that's a little crass. I apologize ahead of time. If you want to beat me up in the comments, go ahead and beat me up in the comments. But the fact is, is life is a, or your time is an invaluable resource. And when you start thinking about organizations, the organizations, they pay you for your time. Now, you might have some some competency or some skill set that you're bringing and that you're leveraging during that time. And they may pay you more because you have that skill set. But at the end of the day, it's your time. And as much as any of you out there like your job, and again, I challenge you directly because I like to keep it real, as much as any of you love your jobs, ask yourself this question, would I do this for free? Would I get up every day, every Monday at five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, go in, deal with these knuckleheads at work for free? The answer is no. And so at the end of the day, work is work and they're paying you for your time because they know that they're inconveniencing you by putting you in that circumstance. And then when you start to think about your time, think about how much time we lose control of because of work, because of other people. I have people sometimes come to me and say, hey, you know, I know, Sabado, that you've got this free time because you're retired. I want you to do this. And I'm like, well, hold on. Well, contraire, mon frere. The fact is, it's my time. It's not yours. And if if I'm going to spend my time on, on something, I'm going to make sure that it fills my cup. Now, I wouldn't say go out and quit your job and just try to take over and be crass about it. But what I would say is start thinking about how you spend your time. And just like with your budget, is are there ways for you to optimize your time? So at least in the time that you're not working, you're living your best life outside of that. Because again, that's what it's all about. And what I've also found is that less is more. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting when you, there's a, there's a guy that I used to work with and he had this principle that he called the tomato plant principle. And he talked about how if you have a bunch of tomato plants in a box or in a planter box and you crowd them in there, then they're all fighting for resources. One of the plants dies and what people have a tendency to do is they try to revive that plant and that causes the other plants to suffer and all the plants eventually die. But if you take that disease plant out of the planter box, then you've created more space for the rest of the tomato plants to grow. And then all the tomato plants thrive and you end up with more tomatoes from, let's say, three plants than you would have with four because that fourth one wasn't going to yield anything in the first place. So it's the same thing when you look at your time. A lot of us, we find ourselves with a high level of angst because on Saturday, we try to do everything we couldn't do during the week. On Sunday, we try to do everything we couldn't do during the week. During the week, we try to get those doctor's appointments in, those dentist appointments in after work. And so by the time we get home, we may get home, you know, some people work six in the morning, two thirty in the afternoon. So you might get home at five, but it's not the time that you get home. It's the fact that you get home and you're spent. 
You don't have the time to spend with your kids. You don't have the time to spend with your loved ones. You don't have time to think about what's going on in the world. You don't have time to think about what's good in your life. Because, folks, if you're watching this video, there is something in your life that's good. And, again, I'm not here to say that uh, people don't have difficulties in their life. But the reality is, is that something is good because you have at least a means to watch this video. So, uh, but again, I, I really started looking at my time a little bit different, looking at it like the same way I look at my money. You know, I always say, don't mess with a man's woman and don't mess with his money. Well, the fact is, is don't mess with my time because my time is incredibly important to me. And because I have such a short window and I don't know how long that window is, there's a lot of stuff that I want to do. And so I want to make sure that I maximize my time, use my time how I want to use it, and feel good doing the things that I'm doing. And if something is bringing me pain, then I'm just not going to do it. Does that to say that there's no difficulties? Sure, there's difficulties. I'm a realist. But am I going to uh, run towards the fire or am I going to walk away from it? And, you know, folks, some of you might walk towards fires and that's what you do. And I'm not here to change anybody. But I think most of us would say, you know, we'd rather have a peaceful existence and a non-peaceful existence and be able to get the most out of life as opposed to getting as little as we can. So that's the that's the pragmatic view of it. But again, I started looking at my time completely different. Uh, number three is my relationships. I started looking at my relationships a lot different when I was when I was working. I had I had people at work. I had uh, professional networks. I had people on social networks like LinkedIn and all these other places where you go and you have a bunch of people you don't know connect with you because you think somehow they can help you and you can help them. I was invited to a lot of stuff. I was incredibly busy and I was I was I held a position at work that, you know, some people might say is is important. I, you know, I was an executive level person and I've run major hospitals and healthcare organizations, HR departments for a number of years and so a lot of people wanted my time and they wanted things for me. And, and and part of what you find at work is there's this whole concept of relationship building. And I'm all about building relationships. Trust me. I think it's important to have relationships. I think it's important to know people and for people to know you. I think it's good for you to be able to play in the sandbox with others. But not everybody is there because of what they can give to you. And so what I found is less is more. I have the only people that I have around me are people that have a real interest in my best interest, not people that just want something from me, not people that think they're going to benefit by knowing me, not people that want to be connected to somebody. And I don't want to be the just in case person. I think the, I think I am as lucky to have the friends that I have as they are to have me. And I firmly believe that if somebody in your life is not making you feel that way, then you should, move them to the side because at the end of the day your time and your relationship your relationships take time and time is your most valuable asset so none of these are mutually exclusive so you'll see a little bit of overlap before anybody goes in the comments and blasts me for that um, and the other thing I started to do is in order for me again I'm 51 I'm, I'm, I'm 52 now but I retired at 51 and in order to get to that point, there were a lot of things that I had to do. I had to deal with uh, racist comments as I was coming through the ranks. I had to deal with unconscious biases. I had to deal with people that didn't like me. I had to deal with people that worked against me. I had to deal with toxic work environments. I had to deal with all of that stuff. And I had to deal with managing life during times of change. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that I had to do. And I became really, really good at it. And then, um, but... I started my view of the world at what became, if I have to do that to be successful, then other people have to do that to be successful. And so as I found myself around other successful people, I started to find myself getting disappointed a lot just because I, I had these expectations of folks. I, in order for you to be okay, you have to operate on this frequency. And I realized that my frequency is different than 90% of people's frequencies. And I got to the point where I said, I'm okay with that. And what I realize is I hold myself to a high standard. I always have. And I think my parents ingrained that in me in order to become the person that I became. But I can't expect everybody to operate with that frequency. And, and where that became a problem for me is because I've always been a person that prided myself on helping others solve problems and get to the places they want to be and do the things they want to do. 
I would find myself feeling a sense of failure or feeling like I did something wrong. And my wife would call it codependency, which I think from a clinical definition, it was codependency. But I, I got to this point where I realized that I can't be responsible for other people's behaviors, other people's actions. And the reality is, is people are going to do some stuff that I don't like. They're going to do stuff that frustrates me. They're going to do stuff that angers me. And so I can either allow myself to continue to get frustrated, continue to get angry, continue to feel bad, or I could release myself of those expectations. And that was, for a person like me, that was a really hard thing to do. Uh, because what you start to realize is when, you, when you're operating with other people and having expectations on them, that then you are somehow becoming a bit judgmental because you're qualifying what they're doing as good or bad. And the reality is, is what's good for, as they say, what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander. That's, I had to come to that realization. And I, I started to, to really push myself away from situations and people. You know, one of my best friends is in a, in a state of transition. And so, and he's a very, very emotional guy. And he loves real hard. He's one of my best friends. I trust him with the world. But he, when it comes to relationships, he tends to go all in and the other person doesn't. And so I would get frustrated with him because every time he told me he met someone, I would get behind that so I could support him and hope that it works out. And then he ends up getting incredibly disappointed. Then I would get disappointed. And I just felt like I was on that emotional roller coaster with him. And so what I've done is I've pulled myself back from that part of our friendship. So when somebody comes into his life, that's great. You're dating somebody, but let's leave it at that because to get into the detail of it, I'll get into the detail of it when it's a time where you have a, a relative level of comfort that this person is going to be a permanent fixture, at least a long-term player in, in your life. And, but by lowering those expectations, I don't find myself as frustrated. And it really helps my friendship with him because now I'm not, I'm not putting that pressure on him. I'm not putting that pressure on me. And everything is fine, and and it works out, and 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 what I found was what was difficult for me was to to figure out how do I categorize people because again I've always looked at my friends almost like their family, and that was fine when I was up, uh, you know, when I was in my twenties and thirties, and then as you get into your forties and people are set in their ways and they start to move in their own different directions and do different things, I realized that I could give a hundred percent to people. And some people only give 50% or 25%. And there's some people that if you give them 100%, they're going to ask for 110. And so I thought to myself, how do I balance that? And so a tool that I use, and I, and I, I use a basketball analogy for this, and I, I think it would be helpful for you. So is I, break, I put people into really three categories. If, if I'm going to spend time with somebody, if somebody's on my team, then they're going to be one of three categories. They're going to be the starting five which are my tight group of friends. Those are the people that if I had to do something um, really sensitive and I had to rely on them in order for this to be right and I could just trust them with everything that I have, those are the people that are that I would consider my starting five. And there's only about, interestingly enough, or ironically enough, there's only about five or six of those people in the entire world. And so I've got my starting five. Then I have what's called my sixth man. So there's we all have that friend that's a new friend or we all have somebody that we're just not sure about yet or that we're continuing to get to know or that, you know, you might have some questions about or something like that. But they're close enough to be involved in some of the inner circle, but they're not close enough to be in the starting five. They're good enough to play in the game, but they're not good enough to start type of thing. And so I call that person my sixth man. And, and again, I guess I should call it the sixth person. But the reality is is my closest friends are men, and so I'm gonna say six men. But if, but it could be the sixth person or, or whatever the case, you, whatever it is you want it to be. Let me know if there's a better way to say it in the comments. But you know we'll move on. And then you have the bench warmers, and the bench warmers are really utility players. And so I liken a bench player to somebody like a Robert Ory. Robert Ory wasn't gonna come in and score 40 points a game, but Robert Ory was gonna come in and shoot the last minute three pointer. Um, you know I always make the joke that Steve Kerr, who's the coach of the of the Warriors used to play for the Chicago Bulls. And when it came to three-pointers, he was money. But when it came to making a layup in a playoff game, he missed it. 
So you can use them for some things. You can't use them for other things. And I think that your bench warmers are going to be that. So the people that you know for the sake of what they can deliver, those are your bench warmers. Those are your utility players. And I found that by doing that, again, it helped me take pressure off of certain relationships. It really helped me with lowering the expectations of the people around me. And it's it's a really huge departure from the thinking I had before I retired where I'd pull people in and all my friends were like family and it, it just became it became too much. Um, and then number four, and the last one I'll talk about is I've started to really, you know, we, we talk a lot about, I, I think people, if you, if you go across YouTube, you go across the internet, there's a lot of really popular things out there. I know David Goggins talks about stuff and um, John Maxwell talks about, everybody talks about getting outside of your comfort zone. And that all sounds good, but the reality is, is that we think about it, but we don't do it. Why don't we do it? We just don't do it because it's not comfortable. And so one of the things I've, I've really put together, and it's a really intentional effort, is to get comfort, comfortable outside of my comfort zone. You know, so for example, I'm, I'm fine socially, but I'm not a very outgoing person. And I like to do things with people as opposed to rolling alone. So now what I do is I put myself in situations where I'm going to be by myself and I have to meet new people. So as an example, I... Uh, this past week, I went to a, a, a minor league baseball game, and I went by myself. I don't know that I've ever gone to a baseball game by myself. And so I just said, you know, there's a, there's a team in town. They have a game in the afternoon, and I love baseball, so I'm going to go check out the game. And so I went down to the game, got myself a beer, got myself some Irish nachos, and watched the game. It was phenomenal. Um, had a great time. And it was, was it uncomfortable? It was when I was walking up when I was thinking about it, but I realized that in my head, that's where most of the angst was. Once I got there, it was like, wow, this is great. It's a baseball, and I don't have to worry about anybody else. Um, the other one is, I, I think I've mentioned in the past that I've got the UC Master, I've, I've applied for the UC Master Gardener program. And the UC Master Gardener program, it sounds good, but there's a whole bunch of steps that are involved in it. So first is just doing the application. Next, um, in a few weeks, I have to go to a meet and greet. And so it's an orientation program where you meet the master, other master gardeners and you talk to them and you get to know them. And again, in social settings, I'm fine, but I've always been a little bit shy and I, I'm not as outgoing as I think people think I am. And so, but I'm going to have to go there and have those conversations and get to know people and get and, and, and obtain some information from them. And so again, that's, that's an, and then there's going to be a point where I have to interview and then I'm going to have to go to class and then I'm going to have to volunteer in the community. And folks, I am completely comfortable with just going in my yard and planting my vegetables. But now I'm out, not just teaching, not, not just volunteering, but also teaching people. And, and I will be, I will have to be the resident expert as it relates to some of these situations. Cause they reason they call out master gardeners is to help with problems that they're having and help you solve them and, and get them to having a, a bountiful harvest. And so those are all things that, that got me stepping outside of my comfort zone. And what I'm starting to find is as I step out of my comfort zone, I get a little bit more confidence each time I do something. Every time I step a little bit further, then I say, you know what, I can do this. Then I get to the next one, then I can do this. And I was in, I'm, in, um, I'm involved in my HOA, my, my homeowners association. I'm on the architectural review committee. So I'm at the meeting. And so most of the time I would sit in the meeting and I just wouldn't say anything, but I've started to become more assertive and say the things that need to be said. And I think that all makes me a stronger person because it's, it builds my confidence. Now I wouldn't consider myself and I don't think anybody that knows me would consider me as this insecure being, but it's not about being insecure. It's about being comfortable with what you're comfortable with and really understanding yourself. And so this gives me the opportunity to really understand and build who I am and just make myself a better me. So uh, that's about all I had for today. Um, again, just the four ways that, that my thinking has changed since I've retired is, you know, I think about money different. I, I, it's, not about, it's not about making as much as I can, it's just managing my expenses. Looking at my time, time is the only non-renewable no, uh, resource that we have and we, we all have opportunities to better maximize the time that we have. Uh, my relationships and, and how I think about relationships and not putting expectations on people because it's like I say to each of you, uh, that, you know, it's not my expectation that you retire. 
but it's my expectation that you live your best life. And I'm not here to tell you what your best life looks like. I'm not here to tell you what you need to do to live your best life. My thing to you is just, it's up to you to figure out what your best life is. I'm just sharing what's worked for me because I do know that a lot of people have said, you know, I wish I could retire and I wish I can do this and I wish I can do that. So instead of me holding it inside, let me share that. Let me just share the information. Um, and then the last one is just stepping outside of my stepping outside of my comfort zone. We're all comfortable with different stuff. Um, and the idea isn't to be uh, to, to do what I do or do what somebody else does. But again, if you step back and look at it from a thousand foot view, you just take a look at what the uh, you know, what am I comfortable with and what is it that I might want to do, but I don't do because I'm not comfortable with. And how can I start building comfort towards that? And I guarantee you that if you do that, and if you have done that, let me know in the comments. And because not just for me, but for other people, other people, I, I have I've had eighty thousand views on my content on on YouTube to date, eighty eighty five thousand, and that's people from all around the world that have seen not just what I have to say, but have listened to and and watched some, and read some of the comments that you put up there, and they learn from those. And, and you know, you never know. Um, the impact that you have on other people. And so, you know, put in the comments how some of the things that, that you know, if, if you've retired, what are some of the things that you've, uh, how you've changed in retirement? If there's a way you stepped out of your comfort zone, let me know what that is because, you know, if nothing else, I might learn from it. And I, I learn a lot from all the comments. And so I appreciate that. Keep coming. We're up to 400 subscribers, uh, a little over 400. So I, I feel fortunate because, again, I know there's a, there's a million places in the world that you could be, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. Um, but I would ask that if this is your first time or if you haven't subscribed, feel free to subscribe to the channel. Uh, as I've said, I promised uh, early, and I'll continue to promise, I'm never going to try to sell you anything. Um, if I do do any advertising, it's never going to be any ob uh, obligation to buy anything. It's just really to share with you a product that I've used that I like. Uh, but I'm not going to just share things for the sake of sharing things. And, um, you know, so if you subscribe, there's there's no risk. But it lets me know, number one, that the content is relevant. And number two, it helps you know when more content is coming up because I have a bunch of videos there. I do videos like this, long forms, usually about twice a week. And then I try to do, I revisit content in my YouTube shorts. And I post those here on TikTok, on Facebook, and on Instagram. So feel free to Follow me here and on my other platforms, and it's all under one name, which is Ask Sabado. So that's about all I had for today. Uh, have a good rest of your day, and I will talk to you soon.